Hello and welcome to Brooklyn Community Board 14's Lunch Learn series. My name is Joanne Brown, Chair of Community Board 14, and I will be your host. Today is part five in our six part Lunch and Learn series, where we bring in experts to facilitate a discussion about urban planning, public space, housing development, land use, and the built environment. You can find parts one, two, three, and four on CB14's YouTube channel. Previous presentations were from New York City Department of Planning, Citizens Housing and Planning Council, New York City Housing Preservation and Development, and the Association for Neighborhoods and Housing Development. We have a slight change in programming today. Our scheduled presenter from uh, Pratt was called away on an emergency, so we'll be swapping in next week's programming for today. Um, so we've learned a lot over the past few weeks together, and um, we wanted to take the time to reconcile that information and discuss in a more freeform way how we can apply what we've learned to the future of our district. We are very lucky to have Richard Barrick, Director of uh, Land Use at Brooklyn Borough Hall Pres Borough President's Office here with us, and Gregory Alvarez, uh, CB14 board member and our resident expert in land use and zoning law. Um, so to start the discussion, um, Richard, did you have any thoughts about um, perhaps, you know, how we can move forward with um, zoning and land use in our district and, and also maybe how to um, just further investigate community input on these processes? Because um, I know that that's been uh, very important to uh, the community members um, about some of the recent projects in, a, in the district. Sorry, you're muted, Richard. So starting with the zoning, you know, the board has already gone through two zoning initiatives. Um, the northern half of the board, uh, right, we did the north flap, which so pretty much everything uh, north of the train uh, freight line going through has been rezoned through a initiative, right, grassroots initiative with city planning, then taking over the application and developing what was adopted. And um, the southern area was actually done before that. So um, pretty much mostly south of Avenue M with some corridors, I believe Avenue J, maybe another corridor were rezoned. So you have a couple of pockets that haven't been rezoned yet. And the question is, is there a need or not to deal with the zoning you have? There's, there's mostly an R5 district that you have that um, doesn't allow a lot of development, yet it doesn't perfectly fit the built character, but is it worth even investigating? You know, you haven't really had additions or new construction in that area to prompt complaints. Um, you do have some areas that we put on record in a housing report we did six plus years ago um, along Nostrand Avenue um, between basically the junction and uh, Kings Highway, where Kings Highway, you have like a arm that stuck out of your rezoning there at your southern periphery. So Nostrand was select bus service and the junction should it be an area that can handle more density and you do have some not very tall but very thick apartment buildings you know they cover a lot of the property so they're over zoned uh in relationship to uh what the zoning is there so that was one frontier we looked at and then you have pockets of the industrial area by where the film studios were that some of that still may be an area where it's significantly enough underbuilt to look at, is that an area to promote development? Is that an area you would want to see affordable housing result because of the mandatory inclusionary housing that gets paired with rezonings? I think you may have, uh, I'm not sure if all the automotive zoning along Coney Island Avenue went away with the prior rezonings, whether there's pockets left to consider for development opportunities. So kind of like getting out in front of where property owners may pick up properties and believe there's an opportunity to rezone. So 
are those things the board wants to uh, formulate policy on in terms of where it would like to encourage housing opportunity because you do not have much in the way of government owned land in the district. Um, are there libraries, child care centers, senior centers that are owned by government where if we were to improve the building, where the building is getting close to the end of its useful life that we might as well look at redeveloping it. Could we combine affordable housing with such developments? We've had uh, a library in Brooklyn Heights that leveraged public benefit. Affordable housing didn't happen to be on site, but it was still important. And then we had in Sunset Park where the expanded library actually includes an entire affordable housing development, and this does require government subsidy. So uh, there's a database we created. If this is of interest, I could prune the database to look for sites in District 8 and share with the board office. And if those are sites you'd want to evaluate to say, gosh, you know, we want to do more to create affordable housing opportunities, that, that is a way the board could look to advocate in that direction. Um, the other issue you had with the rezoning and the southern end is that it may have been too aggressive into down zoning. You had former R6 districts that became R41 districts, and it kind of down zoned too much. So people, especially in the, the larger Ashkenazi uh, households, where expanding the home now becomes too challenging. And the special permit that you have may or may not be an onerous cost, even if that could lead to a positive outcome. I, I know there's been uh, discussions, I've not been directly involved, more on the side of uh, a text change that may make it easier instead of you constantly having uh, special permits to review, there may be a way to have a happier balance with that being as of right. So obviously, whatever role the board plays with trying to see something like that advanced. You know, it's not your typical uh, housing opportunity rezoning, but to households that live a certain way, it's very important to their quality of life to be able to more affordably um, and more time sensitive improve their homes, right? To, to get more uh, household size. Uh, so, so those are some of the examples of things within the zoning realm. And then even where you've up zoned, you've seen a situation where the private sector, well, in that case, wasn't an up zone, it was a neutral zone, like or Cortelli Road. Are there areas now that you know of the mandatory inclusionary housing tool that the board may want to revisit and look at some of those corridors? You know, could you go up one or two more floors and go from either voluntary inclusionary to a mandatory inclusionary housing opportunity. So some of those corridors you have today are basically eight stories, uh, seven, eight stories. So going up another story or two, might that be worthwhile to promote affordable housing opportunities in the district? So, so that's, I think, something's largely in, in the the zoning realm, you know, we may learn more whether there's text amendments towards accessory dwelling units. Does that come with discretion where it's free market units and not necessarily addressing the larger crisis? I mean, yes, there'll be people at certain price points, smaller units might help stay in neighborhoods or uh, not, but um, so we'll see about that. Um, with mandatory inclusionary housing, giving more consideration to which mandatory inclusionary housing option best fits the board. And it doesn't have to be one option for a whole board. It could be different parts of the board may make more sense to be at different rent levels. So you could give consideration to that as um, should private applications come your way, at least having thought process in terms of, well, these are the households we need to help stay in the neighborhood since right now we still have 50% local preference. So I, I think that kind of covers the zoning aspect of it. Um, in, and, and it does overlap some of the decisions, like some of the information you had from the other two sessions 
uh, from uh, Citizens Housing and from NHD. Um, one thing I talked with Sean earlier about with the HPD session that didn't come up was, so you're in a rent stabilized building and you're also in a building that happens to be based on a expiring government regulated uh, situation. It could be a federal uh, where it could be a project based section eight. It could be a city financed agreement. You may or may not have them in a district, but it might be worth getting mapping done of your rent stabilized buildings. You wouldn't know because some buildings, not all the apartments are. You would, you're not legally to know what the apartments that are, but you would know buildings. And ANHD has pretty good resources in that regard. They have this whole uh, categories they've come up with to kind of look for what might be dist distressed buildings. And uh, one of the threats to displaced buildings for now has gone away, which is the term, uh, I believe it was called preferential rents, where landlords would have few rent at lower rates, but legally the rent stabilized on the books was hundreds of dollars higher. So for the moment, uh, state legislation seemed to have blocked landlords being able to jump to what were known as the legal rents because gee, there's things that could quickly stress people out for uh, the ability to pay rent, right? There's a term we use called rent burden that was talked about in some of the conversations. Um, so the more people drift beyond 30% of their rent and, and that number is kind of meaningless because people of higher income, 30% of their rent is very different and people have much lower incomes in terms of the effect of it. Um, Borough President Adams actually when it comes to zoning, we put out uh, suggestions to modify the zoning. Right now, the zoning for mandatory inclusionary housing and other lottery units, they're based on 30% of your rent. But what if I'm paying 1100 today and the affordable unit is at 900 but because I'm rent burdened, I won't qualify at 900 so why does the zoning resolution and HPD policy keep me rent burdened at a very high level when I have a chance to reduce my rent burden? If I could put another $200 in my pocket to spend on uh, food, you know, clothing, why should I be denied that affordable apartment if I could reduce my rent? So that, that requires a zoning tax change. Um, We've advocated a lot. It hasn't gotten traction at the moment, but the more people who understand the issue, the more it could be advocated for. Uh, for HPD projects, um, getting it out of the zoning resolution doesn't help enough because HPD projects all, also come with uh, federal tax credits. So we would need changes at the federal level for our uh, low income housing tax credit and informing your congressional members if this is a concept you like. You know, this is something that has to be done in Congress to help uh, that. We had a recent gain with low income housing tax credits where they now do income averaging. It used to be units couldn't exceed 60% of the area median income. Uh, don't know the numbers off my top of my head, but probably for a household of one that's probably around 45,000. If you go onto HPD's website, you could actually see the numbers based on household sizes, if this is of interest. But um, so with income averaging, we can now have 40% households benefit because they'd be offset by 80% households, but it still doesn't help rent burdened households. So that would be another concept towards uh, a text change that would at least initially help the MIH units be more available to more households. Um, other issues we've had uh, with affordable housing, the city does their standard based on floor area. The state does it on unit count. That's a problem because if I want to argue with the developer to say, I know you want a lot of one bedrooms for your market rate housing, but it's been our belief that except for senior housing, except for supportive housing, we have a lot of families that are uh, severely rent burdened or certainly rent burdened. And the lottery units are slanted more towards one bedrooms studios than they are to two and three bedrooms. 
So if I get a developer willing to do more two and three bedrooms, they're penalized at the state level, assuming 420A affordable New York still exists after June, because the, that 421A is based on unit size. So I can't get a developer willing to do this only resolution allowed because it's more of our units on the affordable side because they get penalized because they're having to do more floor area to get that unit count. So we need to see and sit right on the stage. So assuming they get to conform, getting it to floor area scan is we state and blame Senate to end the difference. So that's another concept that uh, we've been uh, with as well. So maybe I'll pause for a moment in case they're getting some questions in the chat or people uh, want to directly ask questions. Thanks so much for that. We do have a question from Glenn Wollen. Go ahead, Glenn. Hi, uh, Richard, thank you very much. As, as always, very knowledgeable and, and very concise. Uh, but I don't have a question. Um, when we're ready to discuss um, what we want to do as a community board, that's when I, I, I'd like to be called on because I have some ideas on that uh, that area. So for now, I'll leave the questions to whoever wants to ask them. Thank you. I'll just jump in on one thing Glenn said. So normally the board starts really paying attention to these items when they're certified. Um, but board does get in advance, not as much as it used to get, but it could be many weeks the board will get a uh, what's called a, a note application. So it's not a certified application. And if the board has the time available, then it can start reviewing applications even before they're certified and gives you a better application. And the other thing is that, especially more complicated zoning, I find it's good get the developers, the applicants, as early as they will come in, even if the items are certified, because it gives the board more time to digest items. I would recommend that as practice. And to help, I think, people and complicated items to do committee meetings and hearing on the same night out night for presentations and committee and we also recommend that usually you have members ask questions of applicants first, which is great, um, but then opening up to the board and finally public because the public may think of something that committee members haven't thought of, board members haven't thought of. I think it's a very important part of the information process, getting that's right, the public at large. So the more information you get out there, the more it's informed the board, it's time for after the public hearing for the committee to make a recommendation to the full board. So just procedurally, just things to think. Uh, we had a question from Sean Campbell. Go ahead, Shan Sean. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to, first of all, note that I put a few things in the chat. Um, we've had the benefit of some really good studies done by planning fellows provided to us through the Fund for the City of New York um, in the last few years, not counting last year, of course, but prior to that, we had um, uh, Andrew Jones do a great job on e an economic development, a sort of merchant and commercial um, survey of the district that has a lot of land use information in it. Um, the year before that, we had Elizabeth Horan, who did a housing stock report, which has some of the maps that Richard is referring to in terms of seeing where our rent stabilized buildings are scattered in the district and how different um, household incomes um, overlap with the district map. And, and so I encourage you to take a look at that. And then, of course, our famous study, <laughs> I, I'm just kidding, it's not famous, but it's really good, um, by Oded Holgiger. Holgiger. Um, on open space in the district, we had some really great and uh, in, in creative ideas on how to green our district because um, our um, on our land use map, uh, only about two percent of our two point nine square miles is parks, 
an open space um, and um, almost, you know, 80 some percent of our district is um, is housing. So, like Richard said, we don't have a lot of, um, oh, we don't have a lot of government owned lots or even empty lots and we don't have a lot of government owned buildings uh, upon which to build. But, um, oh, and then I put our district needs statement in there too that has a ton of this data, including stuff that Richard mentioned, like um, just how he, I think you just said rent overburdened, but if you get to severely rent overburdened, which is 50% or more of your income on your housing, we rank, um, I think in the single, single digits citywide of 59 community boards. Um, and Richard, I wanted to, this came up last week and I, and I looked for the statistic and, and it's right there in Elizabeth Horan's report. Um, if you look at the wit, at what our district looks like now, without any zoning changes, we're built at a, to about 62% of capacity. And Elizabeth has in her report, that's the link in the middle, a map of where the district is overbuilt, which would be dark gray, uh, built to capacity, light gray, um, and where there's, um, you know, 50% of FAR. Um, or more to be developed. And those are different colors, green and red, I think. But that map looks very, very, very gray. They're just without zoning changes, there's just not a lot of room to to build. Um, and then and then the other thing yeah. I wanted to take from um from uh I think it's you know, from Andrew's report was that um if you do take vacant lots in our district, of which there are very few, but if you took them all and you built them to the FAR that exists where they are located, um, he identified um, that there would you could build 600 units of housing <laughs> and and 100 commercial um, units, um, or we could just open up 10 more acres of green space. So even in our really tiny, not very developable district, there there are opportunities, and so that that's it. I'm sorry, that was really long. I had a lot of coffee this morning. Um, I'll I'll stop there. I'm gonna that briefly. Uh, so first of all, sites that are not fully developed. Sean mentioned a point of fifty percent. That's not a legal thing. It's just kind of a rule of the environmental documents. But properties that have much than fifth or less uh, to use any of the rights or the right to use for like adding a bathroom or a larger dining room, an extra bedroom, right? It's significant. Um, so it's really looking at the properties that are more like 50% or less. But again, it's a household type. If it's 50% or less on a home, getting in and out of it or not, you know. Or you just a larger house. So really, what the is developing is something is. Uh, the other thing is with the six hundred, need to know what apartment size was considered to come up. We've seen an environmental analysis when I started in the field be thousand, right? But we're seeing environmental talk now. 850, 800, and developers have been skewed toward smaller units. So I've, uh, I'm going to look now at average 720. And when I say 720, that includes the hallways, the elevator, all the common spaces of the building are even smaller. So that's the trend. So that 600 is actually a higher number. Uh, than what was calculated. And then there's sort of what I'll call, it, it's real FAR, but it's not market use. You know, like they have this, uh, it's just years. It's just, I don't think the market will work to justify doing that, except for housing projects, so to gain a little bit of extra floor see on one market rate project, I suppose. Um, we'll see what happens because the allowance is much higher than I think eight years ago. Today. So just come to be vessel. So yes, uh, 
and and uh, I think a lot of the commercial sites that are one story, two stories, those are the ones that are more likely. And you have to vacant that those are probably the more low sites for redevelopment. There will be a couple of frame houses that still exist that cut up some R six seven A, so some over time will be bought. You know, either get for that so we'll build for time because time and the house sucks will develop some of them uh inclusion some of them don't. I don't know how your internal Voluntary, whether they is the right to get this or not, because uh, the developer gets a very modest amount of for market units compared to the twenty percent affordable. So the, the only reason that works is for twenty one and for twenty one now once more than twenty percent, right? So that will play out. A lot of the 21A getting the developers are often doing, and you could probably get this in order from ADD. I know District 17 folks did, uh, or 17 folks. A lot are at 130% AMI. And when you look at what the market region is going for, it's pretty on par. The market region is going to get away with keeping the rent startup pretty high when you want free rent. That doesn't happen with the affordable units. So whether those affordable units be cheap or not, we know they're well for life. Uh, positive over time, they may become much less rent than the market rate units. You know, if you go ten years out, fifteen years out, but right now they may be on par with them or even higher actually. Um, so that just some key. Keep in mind, uh, other things with improvements. So when you look at your school yards, your school park the same amount of hours that parks are open. So that's a way to increase your open space. Uh, the term used is jointly operated playgrounds. So you may want to look at that. Another way, I, you don't have too many parks, uh, obviously playground area. Artificial turf with better quality artificial turf put in a way to get more life out of it. We are not get mud bowls. We have any of that in the day because we have uh, you know fantastic renovation or building versus grounds in the first place. Um, things you can do to enhance hours are lights. Are there places you want to put lights on playgrounds? You know, how much of a playground is lit? Um, because you can expand the permit hours, uh, whether it be summer or especially in the spring, fall, by having lights on certain facilities. So you, you don't get land, but you get to the land. So if someone else doesn't look yet, people have been paid the availability that can happen. Uh, we had a question from Steve Collin. Go ahead, Steve. Thank you, and thanks. Thanks a lot for uh, all that information. Um, the um, I was looking at the zoning map and trying to figure out. Um, I was looking at Coney Island Avenue, and it just looks very, I don't know, all over the place in terms of the zoning along Coney Island Avenue. So I was just wondering if there was some sort of history there or explanation, because a lot of the other neighboring areas at least seem to be um, a little more consistent. And I wonder if at least part of it could be that because uh, it's the border of two community boards that, you know, there's there's instances where one side of the Coney Island Avenue is zoned completely differently than it looks like the other side of the street, at least if I'm reading the map right. Um, yeah, so I was wondering if you could shed any light on that. The board having a district boundary there, that has a lot to do with it. Right? District 12 hasn't advocated for rezoning. We have school zoning with many of the development opportunities. It was almost like switching the development opportunities from size to not have sound knocked down. So, District 12 hadn't 
called for rezoning. So they still have a lot of this history, uh, which is people call it an automotive district, and that's you do have a lot of the uses, but it actually allows the widest range of retail uses. And it also allows some community facility uses, um, some with added permits for the standards like schools, like the school. Uh, was built in that explains part of it. And if you look at uh, when you had the zoning, I believe it was 2009, online and look at the history of the zoning maps, you can see what was before and and what became. And uh, city planning did look at Coney Island Avenue as an opportunity for housing growth. So that was part of the exchange for the preservation. And so you could look at Coney Island Avenue from a citywide perspective and say, well, should the District 12 side be finally visited? Uh, do, we have, do we need the amount of our care kind of uses opportunity to help the city given that your housing crisis? Uh, you could also look at, again, the district side and say, can handle the height there based on what hasn't developed to date and pushing it from voluntary to a mandatory housing requirement. So there's a question in the chat. Um, the question is, where is the tie-in to access to, hold on, <laughs> to, where is the tie-in to access to mass transit and cycling, et cetera? Is there an overlay available? So cycling, obviously you can see how the bike maps, if you get a certain are expanding year to year. Uh, in terms of being planned in your district, I am not close enough to know it. Um, certainly, uh, and there's one point you know, available between cycling and uh, is acting much wider than the adjacent streets. And one parking on it won't provide wide stick for parking. On the other hand, streets like that absorb a bike lane very safely, right? Um, have parking, whether parking is or not, because you have driveways. Uh, but I think it's okay for the community to check in with DOT, what's in progress at their end for the bike lanes. But I think it's a conversation the community can also have to decide bike infrastructure with bike lanes. Plus, so aspects of city bike. Uh, where you are with city by placement. Um, and say to what extent you have city by moving. Um, but do you want to ask where by placements go? Are there five sides where you get into the culture of spaces? Are there corners where you know, have a car park at the corner, create a little hazard in the site and aren't perfect? City station there. Uh, based on the retail, especially with the outdoor streets, you're going to get a zone tax proposal. You know, think about that uh, is paralyzing the uh, enclosed areas. So, I can say if you're the weather, um, they've done this. I, uh, Across the cross street from Bar and from Ball, the site should that part of the street furniture that we're having. Um, and in general, that's right, people up so they can go to restaurants with their bike, or do shopping, or whatever. Um, are we doing enough just to have a correct infrastructure? Homes, I got plenty of room for my bike. But where are my other for love? Uh, 
should know with the zoning, new construction parking is part of it. It's not like for two units. It is that standard a good standard? Should this zoning resolution be revised? Um, so, in terms of control, um, car or that that it has them in front of uh, transit cars, whether it's east streets, because most of the trains in New York District, north, south, um, you know, with the trains. To all of your entrances and aids at both ends. We used to have and opened up again. Uh, that all brings in right the, the issue of transit. We're trying to do things with elevator access. Would be open to more density at a particular location if that helps elevate the platform? That's a way to start the transit plan. For now, um, we had a month actually this month, which is a controversy because a lot of words, some are right to take on uh, resolution and make a position because transit is kind of asking you to do that now, right? Um, yeah, the, the board is the board, board made a motion to call for the until October 22nd, so that the boards would have time in September to inform the borough for early October, so that the boards have before the commission. Obviously, some boards may fight through the obstacle summer and come up with a position. Um, but the, the concept for your board is that, that if a property basically abuts the train, uh, whether it's an elevated train or below ground, could, should that property provide an easement to the transit authority so that at a later date we could have an uh, elevator or, or uh, going up or down to the, the, the station? So that's what's for the board. And in exchange for creating the void, the developer gets a little bit of zoning relief. They don't get extra zoning except for that floor space not counting for development rights. Um, but this is an opportunity, right, to create better access to uh, transit stations, including elevator access, right, uh, transit for all. Um, so the board has this in front of them now. How you deal with the time because it's summer? Do you convene meetings? Do you have a public hearing? Um, because we're not going to know how, to what extent, staff from city planning that was at the board is going to influence this to be brought to the commission so that it's voted on the council at the very end of this administration. So the question is, do you deal with this over the summer because it's in front of you? Um, the other thing that's in front of you is um, the, I'm sorry, I was wrong about that. The timing, the board did a resident on that to the city planning commission. So again, I don't know if your board voted. The the one for up to second was the one related to supermarkets and uh, health establishments, such as uh, you may have had some permits to vote on for say health clubs. This would remove that requirement and make it easier to open. So that's the one that the board can decide if they're gonna deal with it over the summer or hope it's still around and to deal with. Uh, so transit that actually I assume most boards did weigh in on that one already. Um but boards did a resolution that doesn't really affect district four except of um percent for the arts that the idea of having stations having some aestheticness that promotes the arts um it would affect downtown Brooklyn that much more and certainly Manhattan. So as a user of the system, the idea of more quickly pleasing solutions to the zoning text um, so it doesn't happen where you live, it could be where you have your life. So that's zoning for parents. So you heard, if you didn't, if you're not sure if the board weighed in or not, I'd love you to weigh in. I haven't heard of the setting they're hearing. So again, that's more about 
looking at properties that develop next to stadiums um, and then we get away for use. But again, you can think of this issue as would you want to promote more density at your stations as an opportunity to promote uh, transit access? Um, so we have a question from Nicole Levinson and Angulo. Hi, I have not such a specific question. Uh, you know, uh, Richard, I saw, I Googled you and I saw you've worked in your role for 27 years and I'm a fairly new board member and I've been attending these lunch and learns because this topic is so complex. It's like, uh, 70 layer lasagna or something. And so I had sort of two questions for you because I feel that one of the great challenges with this topic for the city is its complexity. Like I think one of the, the maybe the first lunch and learn, they said that the original zoning text was like just 50 pages long. And now I don't, God only knows how long it is. So I had two questions for you in your role. The first one was, could you comment on over the time that you've served efforts to make this topic more accessible to new yorkers like I, the zola map is very interesting right and i just wonder a little bit about like what was the impetus to create that because that really does allow new yorkers to understand you know it's not like you have to go to the brooklyn public library and like ask for the zoning sketches so that's the first question is like sort of your comments on the history of trying to make this topic more accessible and if there's any efforts to make it more accessible because it's still pretty complicated to say the least. And then my second question for you is, is how, you know, you're a professional, so this is your everyday life and you probably live and breathe zoning stuff, but like to your everyday New Yorker, not even a community board member, but just like a concerned citizen, what are the sources that you would recommend they turn to, to stay on top of these kind of issues? Well, uh, you left out my time before our field. <laughs> so, um, after city planning in the 80s, reads the entire community district, Elmhurst and Corona, uh, works in a private sector doing subdivisions in Connecticut for HPD for five years, in house zoning consultant uh, as well. Um, so, in with city planning many of these years, I can't speak. But early on with the zoning revolution, they always had a zoning handbook, and every bunch of years they would update the zoning books. So, you know, not a perfect solution because sometimes relying on too much gets you in trouble, gives you a, not enough impression. But certainly getting the zoning resolution on the law has been, you know, slow and fast. So, but I think so they've come a long way. In fact, now. Some of the stuff that I used to put in presentations or in his own hand, but you click a link, you can see what an R78 district is just because city planning has really done a great job in putting it. You, know, you might not get everything about it, but I think first thing for somebody is understanding what's allowed in your block. People have had shock, including some people in this district. That's why I didn't know if I wish rezoning happened. So understanding, you know, you see what the character of your block is. You start from there as an individual. And trying to look at the images of what's built and back up with the pictures in the zoning handbook to see what strictly reflects my block and your zoning district going to do like being the images of what's allowed. Now it, it's not a complete picture, but some districts have nuances with community facilities. Your district has a lot more rights to include community facilities. Your um, contextual district, for the most part, they don't have community facility rights or they're more complex. Um, so some, none of the sources on your road is going to be or at least in the uh, understanding. And I, I think part of again more works more you know, to your block that 
rapidly you hold right. Um, I mentioned those are undeveloped states. Uh, one of the things I didn't for uh, zoning now zoning tool that requires ground floor to we had on we the or these if a developer kind of con do we kind of it is soon to find a condom in the building that we still own the ground floor maybe a separate condo but it's a rental unit. Or I, as a developer, could say, well, I don't like this stuff. It's on the ground floor. They show off back. What I was talking They have part that you know, look through like a screen and you're seeing Southern President mentions ground floor as well, and seven counters floor and left the building higher. So the tool called special and that's another zoning strategy. And maybe something we have to say about areas we would like to have such districts applied to make sure that. As as develop, we are in retail, maybe instead of retail, we get a medical, maybe a house of worship, child care center, but a little bit more requires when what so kind of so the that's now I'll just press a little for the question. Understand that I, I Call that you're not in the fresh map. Therefore, you're not in the fresh map. Um, is because the supermarket happened to be a soft site. When I come back, this is so that, that may be something also to look at it again. Was is a person named any place? Are my places? Uh, Sean, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, go back and answer a question about where we are at with the city bike expansion. And I think we, um, we, there was just a sliver of our district that was in phase two and that afforded us a few city bike stations around along the parade grounds. One of them, we are actually trying to get them to flip it into the other direction because it's on the truck route and people are biking their backing their bikes out into 18 wheelers. So, but other than that, the locations, those were the locations that was in the phase two map. They're moving on to phase three. And in a minute, I'll, I'll put the, uh, the DOT city bike portal for feedback um, into the chat. Um, but they are looking for community input on where you'd like to see a city bike station. I think nothing's wrong with out in front. Get ahead of start thinking about where locations make sense. So it's always best to avoid first and being way out in front of the conversation. And yeah, you know, the sensitivity to parking competition, people who are used to free parking and their real lifestyle change, if they have to afford a garage or even a garage to park into, you know, so understanding smart ways to place locations, maybe. Again, because the sight line is doing it at four corners instead of bunch, you know, be the best solution. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I know the bids and, and merchants associations are having um, um, thoughtful conversations about this. Glenn, you had your hand up. Thank you. Um, Richard has touched on an enormous number of land use issues. Um, but I would like to approach this from a slightly different perspective, and that perspective is what can we as individuals and a community board do 
And that's much, much more limited. It's basically two realms. One is that we get proactive and we try to change the zoning law in some place or other. Uh, that's a very time-consuming uh, and difficult process, although possible. The other approach is, what do we do with the things that come before us? And they are also rather complicated because we haven't established as a community board what our priorities are. So, for example, 1620 Cortelli Road. On one hand, it's adding affordable housing. That's a really good thing. On the other hand, there are plenty of people who are opposed to the fact that it's so tall and we're losing light and air, which is more important to us. Uh, when it comes to Bedford and Church, again, they want to put up 100 affordable housing units. Other people would like to see it as green space. Um, I think as a community board, we need to prioritize what we think is important, and that will help inform us as to how to handle these situations that come before us. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Um, there was a comment in the chat. Um, has the concept of building down a la Houston, Texas been explored? Um, I think in Houston, Houston has no zoning really, so I, there's no parallel, I guess, to in terms of a bus in Houston, really. So I'm not um, really good at that. <laughs> um, and Nicole, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, thank you for your, your point, Glenn. And that was really, you know, I know there's a, some people commenting on like their takeaways from these lunch and learns. And again, I wanna thank the board for, for organizing these. They've been really educational for me, but my main takeaway is what Glenn said is like, how do we as a board, I think that for me, what I would, and Joanne, I know you have a lot of thoughts of this as our new chairwoman, like, um, we need some sort of a framework or policy for, or, or I don't know, you know, for that can change over time as the board members change and the community changes, but like what's really our stance on some of these, I don't want to, the word moral sounds quite heavy, but like as board members, what's our stand on some of these things and our priorities and what we would like to see for the community. Because I think that would make it much easier to make consistent decisions sometimes when we are re re reviewing land use um, requests. So I really thought Glenn's se second point was good. And I hope a big outcome of this is that we could have some sort of a process for creating either a priority statement or position statement, you know, from the board. I'm sure that will be fun, just like our bylaws review <laughs> process. <laughs> um, but I think it would be cool and really helpful. And, and I had a question for Sean and Anya. Can you know someone, I don't remember who made a point about like the order in which thing oh sorry richard you made the point about the order in which the board considers land use topics right like when do we have the committee meeting when does the whole board vote on it when does the public get to comment so my first question is sean or anya could you just remind me of what is the order because i feel like i've been to a few events where i was like Oh man, I wish there weren't 45 non-board members sitting in the room. So maybe we could process this information, you know, or that we had a moment like a, like a space for us to digest the information from the presentation and to digest the public feedback. So could you just refresh my memory on what is the actual process and hearing the presentation about the change, hearing public feedback, and taking the vote? I, I think it depends on the application. There, in, in most applications, they're on a clock. So as soon as we get the the application and know that the clock is ticking, we schedule everything as soon as it's brought to us. Um, and by as soon as I should probably define as soon as, you know, we have we put our calendars out the month before, usually the middle of the month before. So if we get something in early April, it will go on the May calendar. We try to schedule anything that's a public hearing ahead of the full board meeting. So that it can, um, so it can be any recommendation can be voted upon um, before the full board meeting, um, and 
Yeah, I think I think that's it. And anything else that we kind of do that with committees too. You know, we try to get it into that committee before the full board meeting. But that is, we really only have committee or public hearing, then full board decision on the recommendation. Um, so it is a quick turnaround. And I think you know, what Richard was saying is that if we have a uh, an application that's on the horizon, even if it hasn't certified yet, um, that we should maybe be working with those applicants to get uh, sort of previews of coming attractions. Um, and that would be for the board to decide. I wonder, Richard, if there's a downside to that in terms of um, fomenting anxiety over things that might not happen or, you, you know, just like, are we sounding a false alarm sometimes or, or, or it's just early, you know, the, the, the preview might help them then redesign for a better outcome. Or a better application. First of all, the applications that we receive are all electronic now, and the zoning portal that city planning has. So I would suggest a couple of things. One is you could take the link as a board office and distribute it to all board members. And if people need a little session to know, because it doesn't take a lot, but you need to think a little bit to get to the documents. And in which documents are really worthwhile because everybody doesn't have to read everything, right? But the documents are there. So if people want to take time early and then maybe people convene and start talking about whether it's a land use committee or whatever to talk about what's in play. So it's it's known a little bit when you get it. Um, the other thing is when it's private sector rezonings and they have to rezone more than their own property. They don't really talk about the properties they don't own. And so you focus on their presentation, but not focusing on what else is part of this application that the unintended consequence of what they need to include in the rezoning from sound planning concept. Yeah. So, um, you know, not all just like your one on Flash Avenue. The other thing, um, so environment context, I don't know if that happened to get to it probably in this situation. But I think the staff now, the new thing, the chart, you better notice the board gets it, I guess, that this could be certified. Maybe people want to look at the staff link and why waste my time? It could spin for two years before the application gets away. That's not the case anymore. It's faster. But 30 day notices could heads up. You know what? I, I might start looking at this app, not be the final version. Now, I yeah. really it's there. Well, yeah, and, and maybe Anya wants to speak to this, but we do we do put it under the projects tab on the website um, are a number of you know are the projects that um, you know for zoning changes and other major projects are always on that. As soon as we get them, almost as soon as we get them, um, Anya, do you, you want to talk about the process of just getting that tab? Yeah, I mean, we put projects up based on generally on public hearings or committee meeting presentations or provided more information, but um, but we generally have a public process before they go up on the board or, the, or on the website or they're posted just right before the public hearing. Uh, but we don't get notification. I'm wondering, just listening to the conversation about alerting us earlier because we do, we get a lot of calls from residents who want to know what's happening with this or that building. Um, and we don't receive any of those notifications. We have to go sort of dig into the records to see what's going on unless there is the variance, unless there's a zoning variance. So it might be tricky to sort of take a look ahead of time at any of these building plans or post information if we're, if there's not that requirement to notify the board. That's just my thought. Like the as of right development. You're legally required to get that 30 day heads up. 
So we need to make sure that city planning has, I mean, I could forward you the next slide, uh, make sure that you're seeing what you're getting. It, it's simply a list which items and, and uh, if you click on the item, you get the app point closes out. Uh, and then you have to know what to hit to actually see the application documents. But, but Richard, just to be clear, the 30 day notice that 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 applicants are required um, to provide that's on zoning. Changes, right? It's not, I think Anya was referring to the as of right developments. We don't get notices on as of right. Correct. As of right. If there's demolition involved, neighbors get notice and then. When they uh, advance their application have. Uh, for building permit, there's that 45 day uh, review for waivers challenge. There's a challenge period. Um, so that that's it, right? Um, the portal, and I don't know if it's worth the system to uh, do let people work through this app on an hourly department of the portal, people in the portal. To they have the money feature and fill the community so that or like you know those um I just wanted to remind us of the time. Um and I, I wanted to chime in on um the discussion on um you know, precedent and board policy on um, these applications that come before us about zoning. Um, you know, we can't create um, policy or precedent without the community input. And so community board 17 some years ago brought uh, the community in to vision what they wanted to see in their corridor and literally with a map that was on an eight foot table with little monopoly houses they moved things around and envisioned what they wanted to see and um this is one of the the functions i see of creating you know the housing and land use committee on our board so that you know as i've said before my vision is to see uh, our committees um you know, hold events and be as active as youth services and human services committees. Um, so this is one way that we can inform policy by bringing in the community and and literally connecting with them and hearing what they have to say and then build upon that how the board can act in the, the times that we have applications in front of us. Um, I, I would, um, I, it's 2.05. Um, I, Glenn, did you have something very short to say? I don't want to, you know, um, and then we'll go ahead and we'll conclude this this part of the series. Thank you. Uh, first, I, I agree with everything you've just said. I didn't mean that we should uh, be considering our priorities um, outside of the community. That would be silly. But no, I, I just want to address very quickly this idea of trying to get information about what is about to be presented um, in a public hearing, uh, to get it in advance is a little bit troubling to me. Uh, the best we can do is try to educate ourselves a little bit about what the general realm is, because the actual information that is going to be presented to us, and if it's controversial, where the community is going to show up for, we have no idea until it actually happens. So we can't make any kind of decision until all of that has transpired, then those of us who happen to be sitting in on it can weigh in. We also can ask lots of questions. None of that can happen beforehand. So we have to be very careful about any kind of information we can get our hands on that happens before that, that we do not make any preconceived decisions. Okay, I'm done. Thank you very much, Joanne. Before you Frequency. If you're not learned from the public before you start really developing key thoughts and then having to with each other. Well, Mr. Barrick, I can't I can't thank you enough so much for 
um, facilitating this conversation um, today. Uh, and also on such short notice, we really appreciate it. Um, thank you to all of the board members and uh, the members of the public that showed up today uh, to join us. This was um, an amazing conversation. Um, I want to remind you that we have another session next week, and it's our last one. It's episode six, and that's on June 17th, same time, same bat channel between one and two o'clock. Um, and I want to thank uh, District Manager Sean Campbell for her um, innovation in this series. It's going to be helpful in perpetuity, not only for our community uh, board, but for other community boards and um, other communities in general. And thank you very much to Anya Hoyer and Brian Williams for um, all of the work that you do to get this done. Uh, thanks for showing up. We'll see you next week and um, have a great day.